as he as, uh, got older, his got, hands got very arthritic. And in his last years of playing, he wondered somehow how he could even play, mm -hmm. you know, because his fingers were so gnarled and knuckles so swollen. Mm -hmm. But he, he had that uh, in him, yeah. you know, yeah. and he played. With the closing of many of the clubs on the avenue, the city needed more than a few local musicians, teachers, and historical activists to keep the traditions going. The city needed to rely on one of its oldest ways of passing down music, tradition, and history. It needed to rely on good old family traditions and values. We're just blessed to have families, because, you know, I don't know a whole bunch of cities that have families. I mean, have families of jazz. I mean, I, mean, I guess it's like, kind of like in Detroit when you had like the Jones family with Elvin and Hank and Dad, you know, but I think it's the same kind of thing, you know, when you look at the Wolf family, I mean, Warren, who's basic, you know, basically a prodigy, it's a prodigy, you know. So you got this guy, you know, when I met him, when I first met him, he was like 15 years old, but I mean, when I first met this guy, I was like, man, this is crazy, like the, the amount of information he's playing on Vibraphone. My great-grandfather was, uh, he was born in Baltimore in 1905 just after the Great Fire of Baltimore. And uh, as a child, he took piano lessons and that culminated into him becoming a good local area, area musician uh, for the 19, late 1920s through the 30s. And then his son, my father, was also a jazz pianist. Of course, uh, he was uh, uh, Emma Laban's father and he would go on and take the tradition through the late 40s, 50s, and to the 60s. And I would uh, pick up the tradition after coming home from Vietnam. 1980, no, 1978, I bought my first vibraphone. In 78, I bought it, and um, I had maybe just a year, a year and a half of practice before my son was born. and. Uh, he took the tradition from age three and uh, we worked it out from age three until he left Baltimore to attend Berkeley. We worked it out from age three to 18. That's like 15 years of uh, daily. If we weren't performing somewhere or on vacation, every day in the household was building uh, the skills to, uh, to do the music. I would say around that time was when I really got serious about music. Um, it was just a, a mind-blowing experience. And uh, it was just totally out there. You know, the, the crowd was loving it. And I was like, man, if I can get this type of reaction playing uh, playing music and my, my my friends are cheering like this, what can it be like when, uh, when, I, when I'm grown, you know? So uh, yeah, that's one part of it. <laughs> As Warren grew up, he got to see some of Baltimore's greatest local jazz musicians. Much of his exposure to jazz and music can be traced back to the Sportsman's Lounge, a jazz club that former NFL star Lenny Moore opened up in West Baltimore, quite a ways from Pennsylvania Avenue. The jam sessions that uh, were going on were on uh, Monday nights. You walk in, Miss Eleanor, you the dog, who are you? You know, you know, get you get grilled, you know. You musician! You know. So we all go and sit up, you know, buy a, buy, buy a little six dollar orange juice, <laughs> which I which was basically, you know, you saw saw the bartender take a quart, pour it up, and then the big pitcher fill the rest up with water, call it orange juice, and sell it to you for six dollars, you know. But it was the music, music. Those cats played. They swung. They swung. They swung. You know. The Wolves weren't the only jazz family hanging out at the lounge. John Lampkin II was bringing his wife, Eartha Lampkin, and his son, John Lampkin III, to the lounge too. By the time he was 14 years old, he had practiced and practiced and practiced. 14, maybe 15. And um, then I could tell that he, there was something going on. He was playing. And so then I started using him on my gigs. And, and he was handling it and playing. After learning music from his parents and later attending Berkeley, John Lampkin III would go on to play drums for Lionel Hampton. It was the Lampkins, it was the Wolfs, and it was other families too. Whit Williams' children, Chuck Fun's kids, our kids, but somehow they played in the backyard together. 
and now they're adult musicians playing all over the country together. John Lampton's younger brother David and I pretty much grew up together at band practices and you would hear the music in the background, we'd be running around and acting a fool and somebody's mom would come discipline us but generally like when I first started playing trumpet it was just normal. I didn't really enjoy it but I didn't know there was another way. I thought it was something I was supposed to do and it wasn't until I picked up the bass that I really got into jazz. I learned like the recipe of what jazz was. Chris was lucky to grow up in a jazz family. His father Charles Fun has dedicated his life to preserving Baltimore's music history by teaching music to his children, teaching music at Dunbar, and by playing jazz locally in Baltimore. There have been times that Charles has personally paid for the instruments for his students due to lack of funding in city schools for music. But I use music to get kids out of Baltimore or get them scholarships so that they can see the other side, so that they can make a decision uh, themselves what to do about their life as far as surviving or coming back to Baltimore or whatever. He's a pretty serious, serious musician. Really know how to play his, play a horn. And then he became a, a music teacher at Dunbar. Well, that's where I went to school. I went to high school at Dunbar. Before Dennis Chambers attended Dunbar for high school, he was already hanging out on the avenue, playing in clubs when he was just a kid. I mean, we, he was at the closet. We were at the closet when I met Dennis. And he just came in and started playing and swung his butt off. And then later I found out he was working with George Clinton and the Funkadelics. It was musicians like Dennis Chambers, but it was also teachers like Charles Fun and John Lampkin. Another teacher that helped keep the traditions alive was Whit Williams. He has dedicated his life to mentoring and teaching youth about music and music history. And Whit was always telling me, Dante, just focus on your music. Speak the words divine order. In fact, I have the tattoo, divine order, on my arm. <laughs> if you can see it right there, divine order. I got this tattoo, you know, during the darkest points of my life, you know, seeing my mother on drugs and not knowing if I would make it as a musician, um, living from house to house when, when I was in college and out of college and hanging in the wrong crowds. Whit would always tell me, just speak the word of divine order, man, stay positive, stay optimistic. And he's that one positive force that stayed in my mind, you know, other than God. He was like the physical manifestation of God in my life. He was always there since I was very, very young. And during my worst tragedies, it only took a phone call from him to help me to get a little bit back on my feet and to feel like I could make it. You know, he's one of my biggest mentors and he's poured into my life as a young man. The Baltimore Jazz Families and Teachers the local area musicians and the historians were all helping to keep the traditions alive, but that wasn't enough for Pennsylvania Avenue. By the late 1980s, just about every club on the avenue was shut down. Not even that, but most of the new clubs were opening up as far away from the avenue as possible. Well, the, the transformations for Pennsylvania Avenue was a, a transformation over decades. So there was a lot of, uh, there was some physical destruction, there was uh, migration out of the professional class, and at the same time we started having drugs coming into our neighborhood. So our neighborhood suddenly became um, less populated, poorer, and less uh, able to fight off some of these challenges. It wasn't just happening on the avenue either. Most of the previously segregated neighborhoods of Baltimore still seemed, well, you could pretty much say that they were still segregated. In one of these areas in South Baltimore, a neighborhood called Cherry Hill, despite all the poverty and crime around him, one young man would go against the odds and become a famous jazz musician and one of the greatest jazz educators that Baltimore City has ever produced. He was a great mentor to me because as a young man growing up in inner city, not having a father, not having uh, someone who you could lean on and talk to in my rough teenage years, Gary would always take me to the gym he would let me exercise and teach me how to exercise, teach me how to take vitamins like Mr. Witt, teach me to, you know, not sell drugs, teach me to kind of stay focused on the path of education, of doing the right thing, of practicing my instrument. He would let me know that, man, in order to be great, you have to put a lot of hours in it. He was like, anything that you're obsessed with, you'll become great at, you know, and it's important not to be too obsessed because then you may miss out on life and not enjoy that too. But musicians like Gary Thomas, you know, they used to practice eight hours a day in college. 
Gary Thomas would eventually become the first African-American department head in Peabody's history, running the Jazz Studies program. Part of his success is due to his amazing track record of collaborations. In college, Gary sounded like Dexter Gordon. I've heard some of the records, and a lot of people can't believe it. You know, he's playing his bebop stuff. Um, but then he takes it further, and in the early 80s, you know, he was hired by Miles Davis, which was amazing. And Miles heard that distinct uh, innovation in his sound and hired Gary. The, the funny story for me with him is like when Miles Davis called him. He, like, Miles actually called him, and he was like, this is Miles Davis, and he hung up on him. You know, thought somebody was playing a joke. Then he called back and said, no, this is Miles Davis. It was mentors like Gary Thomas and Whit Williams that helped inspire some of the youth to find a way out through music. One of Whit's students was Dante Winslow, who grew up in West Baltimore around Pennsylvania Avenue. I would be late to school sometimes because I'd go to the club and be there till 3 in the morning, playing jazz, improvising, learning songs by ear, which is what every young musician should do learning lessons about life, studying the people and the interaction. Dante would grow up to perform with musicians like Jay-Z, Dr. Dre, and Justin Timberlake. And he would even go on to compose music for films. It was the end of a time. The high-rise projects around Pennsylvania Avenue were taken down. Extracurricular city music programs are cut to nothing. And even in the public schools, Music and art classes are barely funded. In the 1980s and into the 90s, crime is at an all-time high. Cab Calloway, the last of the city's first generation of music celebrities, passes away in 1994. Then, Mickey Fields, while getting to spend his last years with his family and friends, passes away shortly after Cab in 1995. Still, despite all losses and challenges, the city keeps producing musical geniuses. Cyrus. He's, Cyrus Chestnut is one of the greatest piano players in the world. Brings a lot of gospel roots to, to jazz. And he has a, um, a bit of a you know, classical technique as well as like myself. That he brings that to the music. So it's a combination of class, classical music and gospel and jazz. Studying classical music, they'll get in a lot of trouble because at that time jazz wasn't taught. So here I am, you know, in the practice room at the, at the, at the preparatory, <laughs> trying to play the blues, and here I'm getting. Blah, 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 blah. No, I'm not. What is that you're playing? Is that your piano lesson? I'm like, huh? You know, I mean that definitely happened, but um, nevertheless, nevertheless, I kept creating, I kept creating. Cyrus would go on to play music all over the world with legends like Christian McBride, Gary Bartz, Brian McKnight, and James Carter. Like Cyrus Chestnut, other local Baltimore musicians follow a similar path to music fame. Tim Green, John Lampkin III, Dante Winslow, Antonio Hart, Warren Wolfe Jr., Eric Kennedy, Todd Marcus, Sam King, Chris Fun, Craig Alston, Lafayette Gilchrist, and so many others, all of them carrying the tradition forward, playing music around Baltimore, teaching and touring around the world. While the city can still produce some of the most talented jazz musicians in the industry, it can't seem to escape its crime-ridden image and some would say that it is failing to preserve its own cultural history. We, we, we never recovered. We, we, we never recovered. Uh, and it, it, it's just, it's part of why people move to other communities, businesses open up in other places, and that's taking, that's drawing the, the life the, the lifeline or the blood out of Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, you know, again, we're talking about those various factors as to why the avenue has fallen into the level that it's sunken. Um, the riots played a role in it. You know, people's lifestyle and where they want to live. Um, would you want to live in a blighted, uh, a worn, torn area? No. You, you wouldn't, you know? Um, when you don't know your history, you don't know yourself. 
the more we come in, we become in tune with our own family heritage and we deal with the topic of race. We deal with slavery. We deal with whether we were free, whether we were enslaved or, or, or what. That starts at home. So until we get that right, we can't go out and deal with a community or we can't go out and deal with uh, an economic uh, a mecca, a, a main street. We're still hurt by the topic of race. The autopsy on uh, this 25-year-old is now complete. Uh, the names of the officers involved in his arre uh, arrest released. But more information has not led, though, to any more clarity as far as how this 25-year-old suspect, Freddie Gray, broke his neck after Baltimore police arrested him. This is back on April 12. He died a week later. As a result of the serious violence and looting, which has led to the destruction of property and put innocent Marylanders at significant risk, I have declared a state of emergency at the request of Baltimore City. This order deploys the Maryland National Guard uh, in order to help restore order and to end uh, the unrest that we witnessed today and tonight. But Baltimore City families deserve peace and safety in their communities. And these acts of violence and destruction of property cannot and will not be tolerated. Let me put it like this, man. When you have young children, young people growing up in a place where they don't see that they can be successful and it becomes survival mode, you know, those kind of things are going to happen. You're going to get rebellion. You're going to get people that are speaking out when you see injustice happening. You're going to happen. You know, as a kid growing up in Baltimore, you know, everybody talks about the wire, right? I saw that growing up. I didn't grow up in that kind of situation, but I saw it, you know? And fortunately, my family structure kept me away from that kind of thing. Now, my boys are standing on the corner. In a couple hours, they got $5,000 in their pocket. You go to these schools, you're not learning much. It's like daycare for grown kids. You know, if you're not learning anything, your chances of going to college, you're not going to college, you know? So what are you gonna do, you know? And then when you see like, you're just standing around and you're being harassed. You see something like that and you feel like, okay, enough is enough. You're gonna get fed up and mad. You don't know, you don't know how to express yourself, so it comes out like, okay, I, I don't condone it, but I totally get it. Like the same problems still exist. It's just a different time. We'll always find the same ways to react to these problems. So if it's in the 60s or the year 2020, when we react, it's gonna be along the same lines probably, unless the system is changed. I've seen so many dark days. I've been left at the fair 
I've been through molestation. I've been through rape. I've been through the tragedy of seeing my mother on drugs, seeing her passed out, seeing other people passed out, seeing people killed. Yeah, I've seen raids. I've seen, uh, you know, uh, you know, my mother told me about how she was also raped and, and, and seeing all of these tragedies and these dark things that happened in Baltimore City, you gotta find the light. Sometimes kids are hopeless and I wanna give them hope and tell them work hard and try your best to escape the surroundings and the trappings that are in your environment. Try your best to focus on the one positive thing that can allow you to continue to tomorrow. For me, music was the thing. For you, it might be art, it might be dance, it might be rapping, it might be DJing, it might be running, but whatever it is you like to do, do it every day, do it a lot, find mentors, find teachers, find people who believe in you and stick close to them and ask them, what should I do with my life? How do I apply for college? How do I get better? How do I escape where I'm, where I'm trying to escape? And be desperate about it, because people will hear your plea and feel like they need to help you. Look, man, the world, you're young, the world is yours. You could become, you know, like the greatest of whatever you want to do. You could become that. Some time ago, uh, about three or four years ago, I was um, talking to another administrator, and they suggested that um, I write a proposal to open a music academy. And we asked for people to come and actually teach music, um, not just have a summer camp where we ate and drank and strummed a note here or there and sang some group songs. And so when we got our uh, faculty together and the proposal was written before the faculty was gotten, um, then we started thinking about, well, how are we gonna fund this and so forth. So the proposal was written and people in this church gave um, donations. So a part of the proposal talked about lower economic students who needed something more than just going to summer camp. And sure enough, this turned out to be a need for this neighborhood. The, the proposal was a proposal for a music, summer music program, which is sorely needed here in Baltimore, given that many of the music programs in the elementary schools in Baltimore City um, have been dismantled. Um, fundings have been cut. Fundings have been cut, absolutely. Not only in elementary school and middle school, and then in some high schools. With riots that seem to repeat themselves over decades and poverty that just can't seem to be resolved, there is always going to be the few people that are willing to take risks and try to fix the world that they see. They are the ones that teach the youths, the ones that teach the history, the ones that keep the traditions alive by playing and teaching music and arts, the ones to try to open up new venues and schools in the city, and the ones to try to stick around and make something out of themselves and the community. It's more than just music. It's about life. It's about how to navigate in life. You know, it's about, it's about how important it is to be confident, or how important it is to work, and how important it is to prepare yourself. You have to more or less live a life on the edge and take a chance. And you'd be shocked at what your creativity can do because 
That's basic, in my opinion, I think that's one of the reasons why we're placed here on Earth, to be creative and to bring about a change to society instead of just sucking up, put something else back out there. Because you never know who you've influenced if you just influence one. I challenge you to stand up and ask yourself, what can you do to preserve, promote, educate the youth, work with the old folks that got some of the stories up here that is not, they're not being properly recorded. They, they take those stories to the grave with them. The old African proverb says that when an elder dies, a library burns to the ground. You got black folk that don't want to talk. Oh, nobody wants to hear my, I don't. Guess what, we do.